Okay, welcome, welcome to Satsang. As we understand more about life, we start understanding more about the heart, which is love. But one thing I have found that the emails keep coming back to me asking is that what is the difference between soul and heart and life and ego, etc., etc. So, because I get so many people who are so devastating when they lose a love or relationship problems or whatever, marriage, etc., etc. So, here today I have three emails that are very important to explore. So, I would love to have your participation. And your participation means that you tell me what you feel inside and we go from there, okay? So the first uh, email is about this. Yeah. It said, I have a question. Is it ever the heart that weeps? Or is it always, always only the ego? Right now, I am devastated and crying and suddenly I wondered who and what is crying. Me, capital me, who I am, or my ego. Does the answer apply to all and every situation? Is your lover leaves you, if your lover leaves you, someone's child dies, is it really only attachment, illusion of separation that causes the crying and therefore a lack of self-realization? Or can the heart or self know grief? Is it an illusion that an actual separation has taken place? Okay, before, before I begin to tell you, um, I would love to have your feelings and let's talk about it. See, what I have found when I listen to my videos, I do all the talking. <laughs> and <laughs> because of that, uh, we only hear about 30% of what is being said and that's a fact that's been val validated, proven. So, but when we engage the heart when we get involved and really explore together, something else takes place. You see, our ego is put on the forefront and we have to look at it and our heart and everything is right there. So we, we get involved without realizing that we are. And it is that very involvement that brings realization. Words do not bring realization. It is the feeling that brings realization. Something inside says, ah, right. Okay, so from what I've read, how, what do you feel? I believe that the, the crying is from the heart, not the ego. Okay. The ego is too, ra too righteous to think that, you know, well, I still think it's... So the crying comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, if you were to describe, what is the heart to you? as apart from, from the ego, as apart from the soul? My feeling center. Hmm? My feeling this, center this, does. So the heart is the center, mm -hmm. you say, okay. It is the very essence of being, right? Okay, um, any, yeah? I think uh, all the loss is, the heartbreak is from, from loss, seemingly loss of love outward. So it would have to be from the ego. Mm -hmm. I think it's from the ego too. What do you feel? Anything that comes to you. Does it when do, this crying? Does it come from the heart or does it come from the ego? Or uh, okay. I just seen too that the heart can only be joyful. Or is joy as the same imbalance as See, this pain? is such a beautiful point. Really. When we get to know the heart, the heart is the very center of being. It is who you are. And as we begin to explore, we'll find something very interesting. I've done this for, for so many, many years. And it was in the past 10 years that I realized, oh, there is only love. There is nothing else. What we call God is love. It is the only reality. The Course in Miracles says, teach only love, for that is what you are. 
But what is love? The heart itself. Okay, what do you feel? From what we've been saying? Oh, uh, it's attachment. Hmm? It's attachment, but I'm pretty sure... You and where does attachment come from? The heart, the soul, the ego? The ego, the ego. But I'm pretty okay. sure you could like lament and say this wonderful person that lived. Right. Uh, so do we do we really lose the love? No. It's not possible. What do you say? Do we lose the love? It's there. It's just whether we tap into it. It's there. Because part of who we are. Who we are. That's beautiful. It is who we are, love, you see. So we can always experience love. When you experience love, and we know it's our heart expanding, every experience, even if there's a parting, even if there's pain, yet we can grow and look at that and say, I have grown. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And it's an old, old saying, you see. Because it is that experience of love that expands us. But if we start feeling sorry for ourselves, if we start feeling that there's something wrong, I'm suffering, then we stop to learn. Because we think that the love that we're feeling is coming from there. You see, but it isn't really. Because when you love someone, it is you who loves. It is the love in you that you are. You see, and that is the beautiful thing. We're always separating, we're always putting it out there. So the pain that we feel is the most devastating thing to the ego and even to the soul okay because the soul evolves yes so is that pain like self-rejection because you're thinking it's out there it it is it is a feeling of being rejected yeah it is a feeling that you've lost something and that feeling is very very strong because love is who we are so when that love is taken away from you so to speak Okay, you begin to feel less. But when you stop and look at it, and you have had a beautiful experience, because you always learn, always, unless you don't want to learn, you always learn, you find that there is gratitude because you have expanded that much. See, we're here, we are human beings, and the human is to experience. That is the whole point of living, to experience fully and completely. And when you experience fully and completely, the soul expands. You see, the soul is growing from lifetime to lifetime, all the time evolving, evolving, evolving and flowering, reaching towards the heart. The heart is already perfect because it is the being. You see? So you are a human being. The human is the soul and the being is the heart. So they're, they're complementing each other all the time until they integrate and become whole being or self-realized. You see? And that is the whole point. But when we start feeling sorry that we have lost something, then we actually feel that we have lost. And then we suffer thinking that there's something wrong with us. And so we haven't learned. You see? But you never lose love because love is who you are. Now there's something else that happens too, you see we're always evolving and that evolution is the love that keeps growing in us all the time. There's never an experience that doesn't teach us about love, not one single experience. But <clears throat> there's something else that happens, you see many of us have been brought up by parents who are very controlling, um, who live in the third dimensional state. And they didn't answer, un understand that the whole thing is about love. So, of course, they brought religion into it and how things should be and this is a sin and this is wrong and everything else brought with this. So it stifled us. So there's something else. I'm a hypnotherapist and I've been doing it for over 30 years. And what I've learned also that there are people who just don't feel love. Mm -hmm. There are many. And I was amazed because our nature is love. And some of these people says, I don't feel anything. And then I discovered why as we did hypnosis. They've been suppressed as children. Children are to be seen, not heard. You be quiet. People, older people are talking. You see, so the child is suppressed. And that suppression kills the ability to feel.
Another thing that makes us not feel, which I have seen also, is that the moment you're depressed, the moment there's something wrong, you go to the doctor and he gives you tranquilizers, or they give you worse, depressants. That kills feeling in you too. You see? So, but we do not realize that. <clears throat> Because we are to feel and feel completely. Even pain is better than not feeling. Because it keeps you alive, you see. And when we get in touch with the pain and really see it for what it is, then we also can find gratitude. Because we have learned something precious. Okay? So pain is not as bad as not feeling. Now there's, there's a second one. Which, um, this is a long one. And this man writes the following, and this is about suppression. Bert, please help me. I, I don't want to live my life anymore. For three months I'm experiencing such great self-hate. For never... The print is very small, so bear with me. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, can somebody read this? Can you, can you read this? Can you some glasses? Hmm? Um, even that, that doesn't help sometimes. Yeah. Bert, please help me. I don't want to live my life anymore. For three months I've, I'm experiencing so great self-hate. I've never experienced or I can't remember. It was always something that, <coughs> there was always something that covered it. Friends, girlfriends, some activities, some problems. Now everything is gone. My thoughts and emotions about committing suicide are sometimes no longer abstract. They become so obvious, so light, so normal. Sometimes I can't see no other way. I was conditioned with self-hate thoughts. I was raised without example of true love. You've always spoken about such people in your films. I can't love. I can't feel it. I can't love myself. I can't love others. I can't make relationships. I no longer cry, I howl. In everyday situations, I'm just one step before starting to cry, no matter where I am. Even now, I hardly see the screen. I know everything about awareness and spirituality <coughs> in theory. I've translated about 20 YouTube films of yours. I've wrote you some spiritual emails. Enlightenment was the only thing I believed can rescue me and that it reaches beyond my conditioning. Everything has changed and collapsed after I've read. Also, you've spoken about it, about first chakra. That without changing negative view into positive, I can't make it. That enlightenment, God, is only for people with high self-esteem, with positive thinking, strong. It shocked me, so I have to cure myself first to meet the truth. It's too much for me. I want to be someone else. I don't want to have this conditioning. Why I was filled with this hatred and cowardice. Why others have opportunity to feel love, to feel joy of living, to be raised with high self-esteem, to feel power, strength. Why? I feel sick. Something is wrong with me. I want to live normal life as others. I have no family. Once a week I work through the whole night. It all attacks me, mostly after night without sleep. I don't want to describe all my stories in email. If there is possibility to meet you on Skype, it is. I will pay as much as you say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Okay. <clears throat> Now, can you give some of what you felt when you heard that? So what desperate. Yeah. Desperate, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. He wants to be someone else. Okay. But he hasn't been able to change his mind. He's still caught back in the old conditioning. Because we can rewire all that. And we can make that different if we choose to do that with the intent. But somehow he hasn't been able to get past that conditioning. Very good. Yeah. Okay, we can go a little deeper. How would you feel what that we, he could do at the moment, his first step? What would that, what do you feel? 
what do you feel he could? Yeah. What comes to me is if he could see that that's just a part of him feeling that way. And that part is? Obviously the ego. Okay. Now when we say ego, we, we know what that means. The okay. need we're, for we're very clear. Because ego is not something bad. You see, it's a conditioned state. Okay. When you were when you were born, uh, the moment you were born, they gave you a name, so you figured, oh, that's who I am. I am Bert. I am John. I am Jan. And then, of course, uh, came the, you know, you saw the parents, and you figure, oh, gee, I'm separate. I have a separate body. When you started to walk, that's when the ego began to develop. You begin to know you have a body as you started to walk, and then, and then, people said, you're good, you're bad. Don't do this. Do this. And you figured, well, oh, this is wrong, this is right. <clears throat> and you develop this dynamic. That's all that is ego. Because who you are is... Pure love. You are. For your love. You are the here and now. <clears throat> you see? So this is when we begin to understand love and ego and soul. Soul is that which is constantly craving the allness that you are. It can't help it. So when you find yourself seeking, who is seeking in you is the soul, really. It wants to connect with itself. The soul is craving the oneness, okay, that part of you. And so by reaching out always for love, the needing love, what happens are two things that happens in needing love. One is because you can't help it. Everybody wants to be approved of, everybody wants to be ex ex uh, respected, everyone wants to feel okay. You see, but at the same time, that very need for love becomes also your cross. Because need for love is subconsciously saying, I don't have that love, I am not love. So it works, you see. So all the time the soul is evolving according to what you feed it but all the time it wants this wholeness that you are. To the extent that we begin to discover this wholeness, which is our responsibility, the ability to respond in the moment, that very responsibility makes us realize that we are that love when we stop and really listen. You see, and it is that listening, that total attunement with the moment is love itself. So you learn, so you might say, well, seeking is not bad, then if we realize we are seeking, ah, that's right. Because we're seeking ourselves all the time. You're seeking who you are, really are. And who you are is now. Um, Gangaji wrote something very beautiful. Oh, here it is, with her picture. Just received it today in the mail, and I have great respect for her. And she said, we are afraid to lose who we think we are. To really receive I love you is to be the love that a loving is to is to is to be the love that is loving and that there is no room for who you think you are. Because we think we are an ego, we are the past conditioning. When there is a surrender to the hugeness of love, to the annihilation of who you think you are, then you are intimate with yourself as to what is here as the whole universe. See, the love means the wholeness. Like, like we said before, there is the ocean, and the ocean is one. And on its surface, the slightest movement of wind or anything creates ripples called waves. And there are billions of waves on the ocean, and each wave is separate, different, unique. But they're all the same water. So we are all life. And we all think we are separate. But your true nature is pure awareness. You are. And pure awareness does not belong to anyone. Boy, it took me many years to actually realize that. I thought awareness was... <coughs> I said, I am aware. Bert is aware. No. Awareness is. It is self-recognizing. Awareness is the very nature of being. Every one of um, seven billion people on this earth are the same awareness you are. 
But what you're aware of becomes your consciousness, what you're conscious of. Thoughts, emotions, past conditioning all become part of that consciousness. And so you confuse the uh, pure awareness that you are, the being that you are, with the consciousness. You see, and that's where, but once, once we begin to understand, consciousness and awareness are one, of course, but when we begin to understand our true nature as I am, you see, that's when you begin to see that that is the love you are. And it has nothing to do with how you've been brought up. It has nothing to do with your conditioning. And it is that very understanding that there is no separation in all of us. That's what love is. Love is, is seeing that we are all part of each other, completely. And that's what uh, Gangaji meant when she said that when we think we are separate, then we suffer. We don't understand what love is. You see another thing, love is so beautiful, love is nothingness, love is emptiness. So if you don't love yourself and I come on to you and I say, I love you, you'll get scared. He's trying to possess me, he's trying to own me. You see what I mean? We become afraid of love when we don't love who we are. Because we cannot accept that we are the very love we hunger for. See, that is the beauty of spirituality, is, is knowing that you are love, totally, which is the heart, which is the very, very being that you are. So, <clears throat> the last couple of months, I discovered the love. <clears throat> and um, I loved very deeply, but after a while, I lost that love. I don't want to go into the details of it, but it happened. It was later, there, there was pain, there was uh, some feelings of loss. But the moment I meditated, which I did right away, I found gr gratitude that in those few months I've experienced more love <coughs> than I've had in most of my life. And I was very grateful. And that can serve me for the rest of your life, my life. So, I'm saying this because it is something also that I learned to deepen my experience. When you allow yourself to experience even a loss, it becomes a gain. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So whatever you allow yourself to experience, you now have gained greater ability to love. And that love can never be wrong. That love can never be something shouldn't be. <clears throat> you see, because love does not recognize the personality. It does not recognize age or boundary or race or religion or color or whatever. Love only recognizes itself. And when there is that feeling and you allow it to be, you're always enriched. Now, one thing which is very important is why is it that we do not experience that love all the time? Because there is such a thing as control. We have to control everything. That control, of course, comes because of our upbringing, because of society, because of the rules to live the third dimensional life, the world that we are living in. And control always follows three modes of being. See, when we were children, we were told by our parents how to be. And everybody is doing it because that's our culture. Most people are brought up that way. You know, I, I used to hear when I was a kid, spare the rod and spoil the child. <laughs> when we were kids, we used to get punished, actually punished, you know, physically. Of course, now the schools and everything else are much better. There's more understanding, but still, we're still being controlled. Now... Control, there is something about control, because our nature is free. Love is free. Love cannot flower when there is the slightest need to control. When we are controlled as children, we hate it. And that's why teenage troubles with teenagers is so rampant. 90% of all teenagers become rebellious by the time they are 12, 13, 14 years of age. 
they want to be free of that control. So the moment you begin to fight control, you want to be in control. When you want to be in control, you get your greatest fear. The fear of being controlled. Don't you dare tell me what to do. You see? So there is this three. And that is what uh, dampens or takes away our power to love. Because love is a freedom. Love is a free flow. You watch little children playing sometimes. And you begin to know what freedom is. You begin to how when they play there's no ego there at all they're just one with what they're doing so love is not something love is actually a nothing love is this moment itself when you have so much attention on another that you disappear just like gangaji said you disappear within that love that's what love is and that is the heart now when you, sometimes you can become attached to that love which is okay because you can't help it. We want love so much. It makes us feel so good, feeling so free. And we begin to think that we are so free because of that person we've learned to love. So when we lose that person in its physical proximity, their someplace else, we miss them. So if we don't get in touch that it is our heart that expanded that has learned how to be free, we cannot feel the gratitude that also comes with it. <coughs> and so that is the beautiful thing. You see? So, <clears throat> so that's control. Now when it comes to control, we know that, for example, spiritually, we're always, we're always controlling. We can't help it. You see, sometimes people say to me, Bert, how do you meditate? And I'll say, well, start by watching your breath. And the moment I say that, they start controlling the breath. Do you see it? The moment you start watching your breath, you start controlling it. You can't help it. Control is so embedded in us, so much a part of us, that we can't help being in control all the time. And it is that control that keeps us on the ego point, rather than the heart. When you learn to meditate and really watch your breath, and you don't control the breath at all, what happens? The breath keeps going anyway. And then you find, I'm not doing anything. You, when you realize you're not controlling it anymore, the breath happens on its own rhythm. And as you watch the breath on its own rhythm without you doing anything, in other words, you become a watcher, a witnesser, at that point you realize something beautiful. I don't need to do anything. The Course says you need do nothing. I am. Who is breathing me? My God, this life itself, this awareness that I am is doing everything because it's self-organizing too keeps our heart, everything going, the earth rotating around the sun, the feet is becoming a living, breathing child. Everything is being done by this self-organizing awareness that I am. And so as you become aware in that meditative state, you are expanding beyond your wildest dreams because at this point, you know the heart does everything. And it is at that point that we begin to see the truth, that beyond control, we become God itself, the very being we are. But now someone raised a question. And I want you to... Could you read this? This is about control... No? <laughs> it's this one here. <clears throat> Hello, Bert. What do you mean by control or controlling? Because control is necessary for humans, we have to control our aggression because we could punch our boss. We have to control our sexual instinct because we would have a sex with whoever on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to control our behaviors? So where is the border of that bad control? Lucas. Oh. Don't mention it. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so have we understood about control now? Does he make sense? Not to me. Not to me. Okay. See, what he wrote there, many people have written me the same. What do you mean, no control? You need control in your life. See, this is the most subtle thing of spirituality. The most 
the Course says, and I repeat, you need do nothing. Advaita Vedanta says you need do nothing. One time uh, Adyashanti gave a talk and he says you need do nothing. Wow, what would you mean you need do nothing? Because when you, like watching the breath, when you become aware, you'll find that life is doing everything through you. And so, see, psychology teaches create boundaries, create marginal points, create how far a person can go, you know, how you have to become controlling because you have to take charge in your life. Psychology goes only as far as psych Ology, the ology of the psyche, in other words, mind. But we are being, and so it goes beyond psychology. And being means to be. See, the most beautiful thing in life is to learn to be. No control at all. And then everything flows by itself. For example, many people suffer insomnia. And so they take sleeping pills, they take many different techniques of how to sleep, but all you have to do is watch a child fall asleep, and the child does nothing. It simply falls asleep, does nothing. Okay? And you'll find that the being does everything through you. You don't do anything. And this goes with the breath. You control your breath, you do many techniques, but you don't need to do anything. You just become aware. That very awareness relaxes you into being. That very being takes care of everything. Now you might say, what, what if somebody does some harm and you want to punch them? You see, when there is the understanding of why somebody does anything, that very seeing brings understanding from your love nature. Your love nature never wants to punch anybody, wants to hurt anybody. Because that very understanding brings a kindness, a softness in you. That by that very thing, you do not create a problem. You create a, an alignment. You see, the, the reason we suffer and want control, because we're often getting out of alignment. Every time you think a negative thought, you're out of alignment with life. When you align yourself with the flow of life at that moment, then there's nothing you need to do because it keeps you. It creates the things you need, it creates the situations you need, it creates the timing. Did you ever feel so good one time you get up in the morning and everything goes your way? You get the right phone call, you get the right thing, things happen the way you... Okay, because you're in alignment. So, this is how our life script is written. When we flow with, with the energy Everything that is meant to happen will start happening on its own, its own momentum. See, that, that is the, the beauty of life. So, so let's, let's talk about control here because uh, he raised, and there were quite a few others who raised the same question about control. It, it just seems that it has so much to do with um, like conditioned beliefs. Yes. That, that you don't even realize might not even be your belief like you're just so that's right because you've been conditioned into it you see you've been told who you were what you were how you're supposed to be that's how right. you're supposed to act so your ego takes all that and says oh i can do all that and uh basically that's where the control starts that's why when you see young children there isn't any control they're in the moment Mm -hmm. They haven't. They haven't ba basically uh, been conditioned yet. Will be, uh, that's right. The moment the child is conditioned, which is about five or six years of age, is very young. It's cool. But when they start acting, they're acting out from what their parents told them how they should be, how they should act, how should they think. You see, that is control. <clears throat> but when you begin to see that you're not acting from what is, you're acting from what, what you've been conditioned, be. yeah. what should be. Yeah. You see, that's how you learn. Uh -huh. Okay, is that half hour? That's yeah. going to be one minute, any second now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So are there any questions about what we covered? Well, I guess the question that I have is, is how, 
for instance, this, this longer one, how would uh, that person deal with that on his own? Well, obviously he's not. He's reaching out. He's, re he's reaching friendly. out and listening to talks like this will help, hopefully, that he will take responsibility for his own thinking. Mm -hmm. You see, responsibility means ability to respond to whatever is happening in the moment. Because there's only the moment, and the moment is eternal. Okay, now is all there is. There is never a time, you see. We used to think that time is horizontal. And that's the third dimensional plane, you know. Uh, you've done this, and now you're going to continue doing this. See, but now we're beginning to understand that time is really vertical. And we're, we're, we're going into the fourth dimension. We're beginning to understand in a whole new way. And we're entering that. And that's why so many people right nowadays are so confused. Because everything happens to start surfacing. Everything that has remained unresolved in your past is now coming to the fore. Coming forward to be met. To be understood. You see, and it is only through that, through that understanding, that we begin to transcend time itself. So, what I'd like to, to cover next is how do we deal with lost love, if we still believe that, the hurt and the pain that has happened from losing people we loved, whether to death or separation, divorce or whatever, or disease, or learning to love who we are and to feel love okay it's called living question okay so let me repeat because i've done it before but it can never be done again because many people have asked about this everybody has a living question who haven't realized their true nature yet a living question means this it is living because it's with you all the time it's all the time there Okay, it's called a question because it's a saying that the answer is the experience, not the words. That's right, the experience. And you do not experience by going into an answer that has been given to a question because the answer itself is made up of words. The words will never do anything. But if you question the words themselves, and you begin to feel them out, then you begin to say, for example, if somebody says, you know, <coughs> it's good to have love. And then they say, oh, I'm going to be loving from now on. Hello, hello, you know. And you become very loving, very kind, very smiling all the time. You can do that. Because that's an attempt to change yourself. And if there's any attempt to change yourself, you only become worse. You can't change yourself. There has to be the understanding in the heart in order to bring a transformation. So that can only happen by actually questioning the answer itself. So somebody says, how do I become happier? And the answer is, by loving another. And so you try to become loving towards another. No, you stop and you look at how does that happen? What does it mean to love, you see? And love, you can never understand it because love cannot be understood because love is all that there is. So you will find that every moment you are seeking love. <clears throat> There's never a time when you're not seeking love. Even now as we explore, it is all seeking to understand more and more and more. So, by looking at the answer itself, you go beyond the words and it starts becoming a feeling inside. It is that feeling that brings alive the love in you. But you can't get that from the outside, you have to get that from inside. Exactly. And that's why, even if somebody gives you an answer, you look at that and see and feel it within. How does it apply to me? What does it really mean? What is he really saying? And you begin to feel it inside you. It is that feeling, that inquiry, that brings, it, brings you into an understanding. <clears throat> so this is where we go into the living question. The living question, most, uh, most common living question is, I don't feel good enough. 
or I'm missing something, or there's something wrong with me. You see, these are common living questions, but to find out your living question, it's important to ask yourself, what do I think most of the time? Another important way to find out your living question is this. When someone says something or does something that bothers you, how do you revert back to your childhood? Because you see, ordinarily, we can be outgoing, very happy, very magnetic, very vibrantly alive. And then somebody says something and we get caught, we get hurt. And as soon as we get hurt, we go back to our childhood. Did you ever notice? We go back to being little children who have been hurt, which has to do with our upbringing. Maybe it happened in school, you know, who knows, okay, in our childhood. So we, we revert back to our Wisconsin, so we become little children again. There's always that shift. That is the living question, you see? So if you ask yourself, what is it that actually really hurts me? When I get up in the morning, what is the first thought that comes to my mind? What is it that I think about most of the time? What, what, what is it that occupies me most of the time and makes me feel uncomfortable? And then you find a pattern. There is a pattern. When you begin to find that pattern, you begin to hit upon that living question. And everybody's living question is slightly different. Now that living question when you find out that living question, what do you do to heal it? Go inside. Hmm? Go okay, inside. yes, go inside. But what do you do? Yes, yeah, true, go inside, because you look at it. Nothing. Do nothing. That's called forgiveness. Okay, forgiveness means you do absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. If there is the slightest need to overcome it, if the slightest need that you identify with it as you, if you think, oh my goodness, I don't want to be like this, that's where it keeps repeating. But if you do absolutely nothing, you just look at it. It's not me. It's not. It's just, oh, so that's what was bugging me. But it's okay. You do nothing. It's okay. That very okayness, actually meaning it, becomes the healing of that. You need to nothing. See? And that is the beauty. The moment you discover what's, what's been holding you back, see that most, most people, when they find out what's holding them back, they try to heal it, they try to fix it. No, no, no. That is the worst thing you can do, and everybody is doing that. I have to fix myself. I have to change myself. You don't, because you are love. You don't need to fix nothing. Was well, that good English? <laughs> so what about no hmm? the long email? What about him? Exactly. To do nothing. Just be with it. Just be with it because what he is suffering from is the living question bugging him. Oh. All the whole thing is living question. I am no good. I don't feel anything. I am bad. I want to change myself. That's his living question. Thank you for saying it because if, if he finds out you have helped him right now. I feel yeah. great compassion for him. I, he, That's beautiful. Yeah, I really do. Okay, good. I because do. compassion is the most beautiful thing. Yeah. It is our heart that has compassion. What is compassion? Feeling another's pain, you see? But if you take home the pain, then we are back to square one. But you can feel the pain of another <clears throat> because you understand. But you're not in pain. You just simply feel it, know exactly what a person is feeling because you've been there, but now you've healed it. You see? And so this is, this is again, what is necessary to learn to do nothing. Just like when you watch your breath and you realize, my goodness, I've been controlling my breath. All I have to do is watch it. And then it comes a time when you just see it happening all by itself. You try to go to sleep, you, do, you use different techniques to fall asleep. And now all you have to do is let yourself fall asleep. And in time you'll find it is happening. You see, the less you do, provided you are in your love nature. Love nature simply means this, okay? It, it's a total surrender to the moment. It's a total allowing of what is to be what is. 
and I am okay. And there is no experience, no matter how bad it is called, no matter how wrong it is called, that you cannot learn from. Because everything teaches you love. Everything, you know. And to be gratitude for that expansion of that love, that's what growth is all about. You know, awakening has been, you know, so many people talk about awakening as if something is going to happen. Awakening is simply waking up that there is no need for to awaken. It is to be who you are. That's what awakening is. It is for the moment. There is only the moment. There is only now. Can you think of anything other than now? Can there be anything? Is there an exit to now? It's eternal. A million years ago was the same now it is now. All that changed is the earth rotating around the sun, making it night and day, autumn, spring, summer, winter, cold, hot. But nothing is happening. It's just a circle around the sun. <coughs> but it's always now, always this moment, forever. The body is aging, things are changing, but you don't change. You are. You always are. That's love. You see, that's what love is. Okay, namaste. Break, <coughs> ask you a question about this living question. Is that almost like our negative self talk? Yes. That we're not it's even a, a negative. Of? Yeah, yeah. Living question is the negative self thought talk. And if you can actually hear yourself. Oh, yes, it's like, yes. That's it's, it's conditioned. I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. People don't like me. I am unlovable. When you're negative, you think all those thoughts. Everybody does. That's the living question. And the one that keeps repeating all the time the same pattern is what is holding you back from realizing your true nature. Realizing your true nature is the simplest thing there is. All you have to do is take a deep breath. And you are. <coughs> That's it. People are not awakened because they think they have to awaken. But you're already awakened. You are already... Now, oneness is not going to happen. Oneness is this moment. I said namaste, but um, it seems to be going now, so I have to go with what is, you see. <laughs> so that, that love that you speak of, that's essence? Uh -huh. That's the essence? Of that's who you are. Yeah. That essence. When you look in the mirror, and let's, let's pretend that as you look in the mirror, every minute is 10 years. Okay? In about 30 years, everything has changed, your body has changed, everything. But you're still the same one looking in the mirror. That never changes. You are always you. The body may drop. You're still you. Nothing happens. Now that is called love. That is the love. That is the eternal nature of you, that essence. See? And that's what you're saying is so neat because it's almost like dropping the the eyes from that, dropping the the voice from that and just getting in touch with that essence of yeah. of that. Yeah. That's right. So all we need to do is very simple. Very simple. Take time to be still and know I am God. Mm -hmm. You see? And then there it is. You haven't achieved anything, you haven't bought something in you has transformed because you are in touch with that which never changes so you you're still the same you're still the same but you don't think exactly the same because it doesn't bother you it doesn't catch you, you see? yeah so you're saying like even this person with this long email <coughs> if he could just sit in if in he could seat. just sit and really look at himself beyond all that thinking, beyond that self-pity, beyond all that negativity, and really see that in this moment there is nothing, just is, I am. That one moment, if he just feels it, it starts bringing a transformation. He doesn't need drugs, he doesn't need to be made love to by some beautiful blonde, 
<laughs> he doesn't need anything, although everything helps. <laughs> but the, the point is that all he has to do is get in touch with how beautiful he really is. Because there isn't one of us that is not perfectly beautiful. Really. And, and that, then it's kind of like that part can love this part of him. But yeah, that's it, you see, because you're a human being. The human is the conditioned part. The being is. The being is who we are. But we forget the being. But all the time, all we're doing is chasing the being. All the time, it's chasing yourself, getting to know you, wanting to get in touch with you. All the time, you're searching for yourself. You see? But when you get in touch with the human, and you, the, the human is okay, because it can't help doing what it does, because that's part of the learning process, then the human and the being become integrated, and it's called waking up. Because nothing is ever wrong. You see? When Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, they said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see? So that, that is the whole point, because of duality. But there is no good and evil. Evil me is a word, the opposite live. L-I-V-E, evil is E-V-I-L. So every time you don't live, and you get caught in a thought, which is an illusion, that's evil, so-called, you see, when you live from that thought. But if you see it as a thought, it's a cloud that covers up the sun. And you allow it, it's okay, it's just a thought, it's not who I am. I remember Adyashanti was being interviewed and there was something very beautiful he said. He said, when I was seven years old, I heard people talking around me. And he said they were talking nonsense all the time. <laughs> he says, you know, there was nothing to listen to. And I realized how futile the, the talk is. And then I began to see that the thoughts I was having, they're just thoughts. They have nothing to do with reality. He was seven years old. He had that first experience. Mm. And that has stayed with him. You realize that thoughts are thoughts. But we make it reality. We begin to believe it. That's a conditioning part. Now you might say, but we can't help it. Yes, we can't help it. Because we're, we're unconscious, you see. We're not conscious, we're not aware of what is happening. But when you become aware, then you begin to see that whatever goes in your head, just goes in your head, has nothing to do with reality. Reality is you, sitting here, breathing, looking, seeing. <coughs> so even the need, to, the need to know is control. The even the need, beautiful. You see how simple it is? Yeah. Even the need to know. Is control like because to know to is very out. simple. You don't you don't have to need to know. You just know the moment you sit still. Silence is your biggest teacher. Because silence is love. Silence is tranquility. Silence is peace. And through that peace, you come to know everything that there is to know. Because love comes from it. And you know there is love because you feel happy. You see? And happiness is not happiness because I got a million dollars. I'm happy because I live in such a good place. I'm happy because people love me. No. I'm happy because I am. And that comes from love. From knowing the being, you see? From allowing the being to be. And that's when you learn that control doesn't work. See, New Age parents are learning called parenting, called new psychology, to learn to, to let the children be themselves, to express how they express, to play how they want to play, and to tell their parents what they want when they grow up. The parents don't tell them, be a doctor, be a dentist, make lots of money. Just be who you are, do the things you love, express yourself as you are, and those are the perfect parents. Because there's no control, you see. And so the child becomes self-responsible when they learn to follow their love. Instead of saying when you're on a picnic, get over here, lunch is ready, come over when you're hungry. Yeah, come over when you're hungry. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, yeah, that's that's a hard one after you've been cooking for a long time. <laughs> that's, true. Yeah, that's, cold. that's true. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. but you can say to them too. You can come later, but the food will be cold. Right. You see, and then they become responsible. Oh, they come and it's cold. I won't do it next time. You see, that's how they learn, not through controlling them, but but simply talking to them. You see, and then they learn response ability, the ability to respond, right? And it's only love working. Well, that's where this, the self develops from. That's right. That, that's when right. When you just said ability to only respond. Only through love can we can we truly develop as human beings. Yeah. Love is the only thing there is. There is nothing else but love. And what we call God is not an entity out there. It is love itself. The power of love, which is so incredible. It's far more intelligent than, than we could ever even conceive. You see? Even looking at a body and seeing how the food is digested, eliminated, you know, assimilated and, and everything and, and how the heart is beating and everything just even the body, the cells, how they're today, how the body appears so real because it is consciousness and appearance. Incredible. The senses, everything is part of that miracle of that love. And then we can go more and look at the uh, at the gravity that keeps the earth rotating at 20 miles per second and we feel very solidly planted on the earth. You see? So, so this is the, um, when we begin to see all this, we see that everything is directed by love. Everything. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Okay, namaste. The second. <laughs>